so let's go to the scope uh, views, please. And we've already done a lot of this ahead of time, so that will hopefully save us some time here. Can you guys see this? Uh, see yeah. Yes, I think uh, the scope screen, we can center it a little better. Yep, let's center it. Harvey, can we center the scope screen? Bring it towards yourself. Yep, there, good. that's good. And yep, that'll work. Okay, so we did a lot of this prep ahead of time. You can see here, you know, unfortunately, this person has a trochlear defect. Okay, the rest of the patella looks good. You know, an isolated trochlear defect, good alignment. You know, I'm just doing an isolated base on these. I know you guys mentioned for your patellas. Like I said, I'm similar, you know, I'm probably like in that high 90% for doing an osteotomy in addition uh, for a patellar defect. Um, but obviously, I still look at the alignment, TTTG, everything else. Uh, so here, usually there's different ways to take this, but I do this from the intercondylar notches. I find it a little bit easier. And again, I do not take from the defect. Uh, there is some data that shows about, um, you know, 60 to 70% viability. So I like to do it from the notches. It's a little bit easier and better. So I use a, I use this curette here. It's a little minuscule curette. I use for other different um, types of procedures as well. I always start going up, going down, because I find that if you do this, you'll sky, especially with the angle. And so you can hold the scope right there. Grant, is that a two-sided curette or one-sided? One-sided. And then the, the trick to this is actually, this is, it seems like it's really gonna be quick, very easy, but sometimes you can skive off, so you gotta be really careful, because it's really sharp. So you're just slowly wiggling back and forth, back and forth. And you take off some bone sometimes too, and that's okay. As you get to the top here, you wanna be, don't wanna get overzealous when you're taking it. So I usually leave that little perch there, and we won't do the whole thing, but usually you wanna have two to three Tic Tacs, so several hundred milligrams, and a lot of the best cells are closest to the bone. So I think you know taking a little bone or seeing that bone is, is a critical uh, and then pearl. You can see right here, open it up and take that on the telephone. Perfect. And then usually two to three of those. But what I find is, you know, I found out after doing a few of these, and then what I'll do is just have like a shaver or something. Brent, do you always yeah. take lateral, or will you take from the top or the medial side? Um, I actually will do both, to be honest with you. I'll do a, you know, a good one here, and then I'll switch portals, and I'll come from the other angle, and I'll at least take, I at least try to take about two to three Tic Tacs, but which is really nice. One, you don't do any damage by doing that. But two, what's interesting is I found out that I had enough for two or three Macy's. So like actually one of the patients I'm doing in two weeks, they canceled the case the week before, and we were able to get another Macy for them. So it's not like you want to you know, have enough for five or six rounds. But every once in a while you have a problem and something happens, there's you know, snowstorm or power outage or something crazy as we are seeing more these days. And uh, it really helps you to have that backup. So yeah, I, I, think, I continue yeah. to do that two to three Tic Tacs and it gives me that one to two Macy's in case there's some issue later on. I tend to use a curve. Uh, it's a five year wait, which you, you know, if something happens and another, another cartilage defect happens then you can use that again. Yeah, I tend to use a, a curved gouge for these cases, but I think your technique uh, is very straightforward as well and uh, nicely demonstrated. I also like to show patients, Grant, that um, the condyle is huge and that we've taken so little of it. You know, so you can often even do a video or just do a picture, just showing how little that biopsy site is and how non consequential it is. Yes, and then I also tell them, you know, we do notch classes and other things for meniscus transplants or other cases. You know, we're taking a little more than that to even get access sometimes where we want to go. So this is, you know, completely non wafer as you mentioned. And then one thing I like to do, it's a kind of interesting picture. I, I always do this picture at the end. So you'll show this trochlear defect, but then I show this picture right here. Where it kind of looks at like nasty, you know, it's kind of going onto itself. That really brings out, brings it home to the patients. Hey, listen, that defect is really loading onto the cartilage. And when you have a kissing lesion or something else where you have both or defects, you really can see how they interact with that photo. So I like that photo because when I'm preparing for the next round of uh, cartilage, I really use that photo to see like, what are we dealing with here? Exactly the contour, especially the telephemoral. For me, from a condyle, it's a little bit different. Just to add, uh, uh, you can also, um, you know, do a dynamic uh, MPFL exam. You can look at lateral retinaculum tightness. You can use a 70 degree scope from above and look down at patellofemoral tracking. I mean, so you get a ton of information uh, to assist, but in this case, it's an isolated central trochlea. Um, yeah. without any concomitant malalignment, correct? 
Correct, yes. So this will be straightforward, which is good for people to learn kind of the first process. So we're going to go to the open portion. We've actually made the open portion already, so it'll be a little bit faster. I know you guys are talking about my speed. You know, I'm no Brian Cole, but I'll do my best here. Hey, hey Grant, so uh, while you move over to the open, uh, you kind of talked about some metrics in the PF joint. So the TTTG here, we're assuming is normal. Uh, and TTTG yep. Normal. And potentially. And patella height is normal. So, are there any times with normal parameters that you're doing a, an isolated anterization TTO with this, or are you uh, basing it on those measurables and not doing TTOs with these trochleas? A trochlea, I'm not frequently doing an anterization isolated. But with, like I said, for patellas, I feel like I'm pushing the envelope on the patella. I'll have a 13, you know, a lateral defect or something I really want to get an anterization on uh, in the patella, and I will do the TTO for that reason. So it's, I'm much more, I'm much more aggressive on patella. I'm much less aggressive on a trochlea. That's just my own practice. Yeah, I think for me, it's interesting. I probably on those trochleas, especially in those 30 or 40 year olds, the isolated trochleas without malalignment, I might go to an osteochondral solution without an osteotomy. Whereas for me, if I'm doing a cell based repair in PF, I'm typically adding even an anterization. I think it's just dealer's choice what you get great outcomes in your own hands. Um, uh, if, if I can get away with an isolated Macy and get awesome outcomes most of the time, that's obviously much easier than adding a concomitant procedure. But uh uh, do you go medial or lateral for this approach? Okay, yeah, so I was going to show you guys this. So sorry. So basically, I always go midline. So I know a lot of people, they do, uh, you know, through the medial portal or through the lateral portal. And I started doing that early on. But what I found was one for cosmesis. The incision, when you finish, even if you put a straight incision, a little bit of flexion or extension, it tends to curl a little bit. Patients thought that was a little unusual. Maybe it's just my technique. Um, but I like the midline because, honestly, a lot of these cartilage patients, this may not be their last procedure. And so I like this midline approach, too. If you do with a patella especially, and we're gonna do a trochlea here, you you can do an open lateral release, which is, you know, arthroscopic's great, but these open releases, you can get a lot more mobility and you get a lot better access. You know, we made a bigger incision here, but I can make a much smaller incision and flip the patella if I just do a small lateral release. If you just stay on the medial side for a medial approach, you won't be able to access that nearly as well. And you know, again, this is a bigger approach for the cadaver. With a central trochlear defect, I will go medial. With, if it's more laterally based, then I'll go lateral. I will adapt to whatever the, to make the smallest incision, but still be able to be successful with the procedure. Yeah, I think for a lot of these, um, accessing them uh, through a lateral retinaculum lengthening type approach, uh, particularly if combined with a TTO, uh, and keeping that TTO unhinged uh, will give you the easiest access, of course. Uh, when you're doing this without TTO, you have to be a great surgeon like you are to get the exposure that you're about to show us. Um, tell me about the fat pad. Uh, any tips or tricks yes. to get that out of the way? So first off, you know, I extended here again. Some people do a vastus sparing, but for we have a big patellar defect or you're trying to really get a lot, this is, again, we're lucky. This, this patient cadaver is much more flexible, a lot more flexible tissues. Sometimes you have to make a bigger uh, extension even to get this type of access. So we're really lucky with that. Um, the uh, I always I with the fat pad I've been trying to take less and less of it out because I worry about that's going to cause um, some arthrofibrosis or some stiffness. But I will do a little bit of fat pad release. And then the key here, which you guys can see down here, is when I'm making my incision. I'll just use a mark. You want to make sure you don't damage the meniscus. That is the number one thing you worry about when you're doing this approach. When I have it combined with the meniscus transplant, the nice thing is you can move the transplant out of the way if you're doing a plug technique. But you know, you take that fat pad down all the way. We have a, um, a knife, please. I'm kind of showing what we're doing. Okay. Yeah. So you can see we're taking this down and like, do this almost layer by layer. And then you're watching it. Sometimes my assistant from above can tell me how close my meniscus. When I get right next to that meniscus, then I start coming across. And that way I can get in the extension. But the other trick is if you can't get good access, you can come down lower, you can see here, and you see I'm sort of releasing those fibers and it's opening up even more. So you can get almost basically to that approach right next to the patella tendon to get that seal we're getting more release there. And it's in sort of a revision situation, if there's a scarred fat pad, you can start going across. Now again, you gotta be careful because when you take the tourniquet down, uh, there can be a lot of bleeding in the fat pad. So I really try not to manipulate it as much as possible. Yeah, I agree, agree with not manipulating the fat pad. I sometimes release it off the patella side, uh, which gives me more mobility yes. as well. But uh, that looks great. Yep. Yeah, so when I do a TTO, and sorry I'm being distracted with that part, but the, uh, when I do a TTO or something else, I actually now will, I will release fat pad completely off of the patella and leave it intact. And I found my patients are much less stiff doing that too. Yep. So I sure. like your idea of doing that with this. 
it's a little different and just because I want to make sure I protect the meniscus and I get down low and I find that I get a little better access. Yep. But for those other ones with the TTO, yes, I agree with you. I, I yep. do it the same way. Looks great. All right, so we only have a few options here, but again, let's go to the, uh, before we do this, let's go to the table really quick. We have a trial set. This is just a set for uh, basically cadaver use, um, but we have normally a bunch of these different options, but these are really nice. This has really sped up the procedure, made it efficient, and most of my defects will fit in this level. So we've got larger, smaller. Here we only have two, um, but when you're in, you know, doing a real procedure, there's like seven or eight different options. You got to see that Brian used that really long, elongated uh, guide system, which is really good for the condyles. Um, but basically, I chose in this case, and a lot of them are this oval that I do, especially on the trochlea or patella. But this oval is really nice because it can get that sort of elongated thing, but you're not going to be too wide. Anyway, so here's the deep, here's the um, guide we're going to use. All right, so let's go back to the knee. So Grant, I'm just going to answer a question while you go back there. We typically are using Z retractors, so that's what you saw them use. I also like the sharp 90 degree Hohmann retractors are outstanding for this work. So this trick is interesting. So the way the handles are really nicely curved. I like to do this. I basically go onto the defect. I lean in. And you, I don't know. You can't hear it, but there's a crunch, and that crunch is when you go right to the cartilage. And trochlears are really nice because you get a really deep bite. And I rock it back and forth, holding that thumb pressure on there. And you can see you get a really nice cutout. And now we're going to kind of move promptly so you can get this. So you can move on with this. Okay. So the key here is I say right along the border, and I'm trying to take off. We're trying to get to the calcified cartilage layer, which is the white layer. The interesting thing is this is actually a little. I almost find this sort of the after the first few Macy's I did, you start to get the feel for it. But it's really not just like a single scrape and dig, which you can run into and have a problem. Um, you want to really have that sort of long sweeping motion here. So you can see how we're doing that long sweeping motion. We're taking off the cartilage. But you can see here, it's, it's a little harder on the cadaver. I don't want to use the light because then you won't be able to see as well because there's a lot of glare. But you can see that this sort of like shiny white layer, that's the layer you want to go. That's the calcified cartilage, one layer above the subchondral bone. Now, the one thing I like to do, and this is Corbin, my PA, he's gonna be helping. So I don't like to, I like to be efficient in the OR. So you can see one goes above, one goes below, and we, we take turns and you use that suction, which I really like, and you can see it's efficient. And the key here is that, you know, constantly make sure you're staying right on that border. Do you ever use a 15 blade anymore or not really? Oh, you are beating me to it. So yeah, so let me show you how to do the rim really quick. All right, can we have, so hold this please. So first off, this is my another trick. I don't actually know what this is called, but it's, it's a little <laughs> small direct from the hand section, but I love this. And this gets that little border on the edges. And then, you know, when you really want to finish off, you have 15 blades, exactly what the sound is saying. So I use that 15 blade, you really want to get that ring, you know, right around here. It's similar to sort of how you deal with, you know, the transplant section. So if you want to get that little edge, I'm a big proponent of, you know, not oversizing, but really making sure that this goes in perfectly flush. Because if you start, if you, the last thing I want is my implant to be a rolled border. And I like it when I put this implant in that it doesn't have any rolled borders. And then it so, fits really nicely. Yeah. I think that's a key point. I mean, I would much prefer to undersize my Macy and have it flush with the subchondral bone bed and not pie crusting up over the edges where it has a risk of early delamination and failure. Uh, that was one of the questions that we didn't get to uh, from one of the fellows before. Uh, so I think that's an, an important uh, point to make. So I'll tell the fellows who are listening, the number, the two biggest mistakes you're going to make when you first start doing these um, is one, obviously the biggest mistake is going to be uh, timing wise, if you have a lot of procedures going on at once, but really the two biggest mistakes are to undersize the hole and to go too deep on your curetting. So the biggest, so those, to, to avoid the um, too deep thing, you want to really make sure you see I'm not digging down. You guys can see that. I'm really trying to be flat on here, and I'm just that you can you can almost feel it. You can see it. It's a smooth motion when it starts gliding. Since you were taking off the cartilage in that smooth motion get down to that white surface. If you break through, it's okay, but you try not to do that. Do you use a tourniquet? So I will use a tourniquet. I do so a TXA within the four minutes before I put the tourniquet um, uh, up, transitioning acid every single time, and then I put the tourniquet up, and then after that I will do the whole approach, and then I take the tourniquet down and do any take care of any bleeders. I find that's a little bit easier. Early on I did it without tourniquet the whole time, I find that I'm much more efficient if I do it with the tourniquet up first. 
Um, and then when I take it down, the TXA usually kicks in really well. And basically, if you don't damage the fat pad too much, you really don't have that much weight. How about, how about you? Yeah, I, I'm typically in my you know combined big osteotomy cases. I'm I'm not using tourniquet as much, um, but I have found uh, for efficiency's sake, if I'm doing a lot of intraarticular work, you know, revision ACL meniscus transplant, for example, plus maybe a cartilage defect, that I will use a tourniquet for a lot of the time and do what you just described. Um, yeah. Are, are you? Uh, um, what are you using for hemostasis? So hemostasis. So I start off. With, we'll show it in a second. So I start, I start off with a like neurosoap patty, so epinephrine. Um, and then if that doesn't work, you can do gel thrombin, which I don't use as often, but you can do that. And then finally, the trick is to use the seal, so uh, the fibrin glue. And you can push that into the defect, get that to stop bleeding, and that's really effective. So we're not, for the sake of time, we're not going to do the whole, full prep. You guys can see here, right on these sides, where that's where you want to be. Um, we'll just double check one more time to make sure that we have the uh, orders pretty well done. And the other trick you can do with this, and I'll go back to that bleeding situation you mentioned. Um, you can use this to kind of twist this guy around, and that'll get your edges a little bit better. Um, and I like that as well. And one more cup, we'll try to get this. So you can use Seth's idea of the 15 blade. That works really well, too. You can see how this part does take time, and it, it really is critical to be meticulous. So um, thanks for sharing those pearls on the defect prep. Okay, so we're not obviously having bleeding, but this is what I do. Kind of push it on there. That gets the bleeding stop. If that doesn't stop, then we go on to seal. All right, so we're going to move on. Let's go to the table. We'll show how we do this since we have 11 minutes left. All right, can you zoom in on this dish? So normally this is the part where it holds your breath. You switch it around with the new system, pour it on, and hopefully that it goes in there nicely. Again, we haven't had any issues, um, but that's the one part that can be a little stressful. So I always put it in this dish. You can see right here, pull it out. These are toothless pickups, they come in the set. Can you see, perfect. And then this is cleaned up, this guy has been cleaned off. So Grant, okay. just uh, pause for a second, because uh, so the way you picked it up, one, those are pickups without teeth, and you grabbed it from the upper corners where the least amount of uh, cells. So both those are just huge uh, principles. So you didn't manipulate it. And then tell us about the notch. Uh, the notch on the bottom left-hand corner, um, and that's where the cell side's up. That's the orientation you want to keep it the whole time, and then come do the fish. Uh, and then when you do this, you can saw that he hits pretty hard. The key here is. With these smaller guys, you don't have to worry about the hammer going all the way through. With bigger ones, you want to be a little more careful. But the biggest problem when you do this is you don't hit it hard enough. And everybody gets freaked out about hitting it so hard. you got to hit it fairly hard to get up cut all the way through. And then you take it up, and you've got a nice cut there. And then here's our toothless pickup. So this is easy, but it can be confusing. You see the cell side is up when he cut it and it's up in that little container. And then the cell side will be down. That's the rough side down when you put it into the defect, the smooth side is up. And so that orientation with the notch is critical. And for odd shaped defects, that's a very, very important uh, uh, tidbit or pearl. And then Grant, just to tell you, uh, we just submitted this for an abstract, looked at cutting uh, versus manual uh, and basically found uh, no significant differences in viability with hitting uh, the heck out of it around the edges. So it validates this technique in my mind. Awesome. Thank you. You, you always, you always one up us with your great studies. I appreciate it. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So here I'm pretty little to seal. Now, once you start activating it, then it, it can get sticky on the tip. So you put that in, I put a little layer there, and then we're going to put the implant on. So again, we're assuming the bleeding stops. If the bleeding hasn't stopped, we put pressure there. All right. So. We're going to try not to drop this. We're going to bring it over. Sorry, you guys can't see. I'll try to show you as best I can. Everyone tries to use the two pickups. I find that a little bit challenging. So here, let me show you come in here. So it's still the right direction. Now, cell side is down. That's the trick here. Shiny side up. Okay, so putting it in. And then really minimal manipulation. And I always do what I think I used to do with the pickups. Okay, so we've got that. And then this part is the one where I actually have my... Yeah, just calmly do it. That way I can have a conversation. Hey, Grant, so how do you manage if you know that it's overlapping? Uh, what do you do exactly? If it's um, going over the edge somewhere, overlap. you're too you're too big. Oh, the, 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 oh, too big. Right then and there, I'll take it out. And I'll take it out and I will recut. I will try to make, I don't try to cut the Macy because that's much more challenging 
and you can you can damage the cell uh, the cells and everything else. So I will take it out and recut uh, more on the actual cartilage portion. That's what I usually do. It's just a little bit easier for me. Yeah, so I think if you have enough, uh, that's clearly you know an option. You can do that. Um, uh, oh, you're talking about cutting the uh, the recipient bed. Yep. Um, I think uh, what I do is try to get a best fit in most areas. So if I can get three quarters of it best fit um, flush uh, with the subchondral bone, sometimes you can sneak in the small scissor before you glue the periphery. Uh, and, uh, you can just trim the edges so it doesn't pie crust. So I just go and worry about, you know, the majority of it and we'll take care of that little area, uh, before I do my final to seal. So I think that's another way you can handle it. And that's a good pearl. Yeah, I know. I, I'm sorry. I didn't, um, I didn't word that perfectly. So for, if it's a big one, it's way off, then I'll do that. If it's something small, then I will do the same thing as you, or I'll use a 15 and just be really careful along the edges. So mm -hmm. you can see how we have that in there. Then you put a second round of glue. And, and again, this is one that they're using the same tip, but a lot of times if you get, you know, a full three minutes, the problem is that this will get sticky. So you take that off and you put a new tip on. That's important to know. Um, and then when you put this glue on, I do one minute of holding pressure. Then I have uh, Trover's County tell me, I take it off and I take a look at this and make sure, because one of the things that you can do that's a mistake is when you put digital pressure on this, you can move your finger around by accident, even a little movement. And the implant can be, can be adjusted inappropriately. So the number of times that I move it is probably about five, ten percent. So it's not it's not benign. So then if I see that, I'll just make a little movement at one minute. You can still do that. I put the second round of steel. The qu the question people have a lot is about doing uh, sutures because we obviously were, we enjoy this new technique. We don't have to use sutures, but I still do them sometimes, especially in patellas. To so usually use a six o vibro, um, and I'll do that six o vibro when I'll do that six o vibro about one minute into the second round of steel. That way I can be still efficient. And I can, I, I can use the stickiness of the implant already stuck on there. And then I'll backfill that for another minute or so. And did that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think if I have larger defects, if I have any areas of, where I'm less contained uh, or just worried about it in general, I'll have a low threshold to do 6 ovicral or a low threshold even to put in like the mini anchors loaded with that. Um, so those are all options. They're just less frequent these days uh, uh, with the, the current generation Macy technique. Um, the patella cartilage is the thickest in the body. And so, um, you know, I actually find that it, it's, you know, I have more comfort uh, in my patella than in my trochlear or condyles. So less need in general for me to suture uh, in that location, you know, in, in most of my cases. Um, while you're waiting for the, uh, to seal to dry, um, there's a question about uh, concomitant osteotomy, uh, MPFL, and Macy, uh, your kind of order of operations. Uh, kind of walk us through briefly how you uh, go through that in your mind. Okay, great. So I do a fair number of the combo ones. So I'll usually start with a TTO. That way I cut it and I can easily manipulate the uh, patella, uh, whatever I need to do. Then I do the fixation, the anchors for the MPFL. So you put them here. Now we're assuming this is a patellar defect you're dealing with. Yep. So put the anchors in the MPFL, drill the socket for the MPFL, depends on how you do it. And then, but I don't put the graft on yet. Um, or I may fix the graft at that point and I'll, and I'll, or fix the graft at least on the patella. Then I will do the Macy. Then I will fix the tubercle and then I'll finalize the MPFL and then I'll check it all at the end. Is that yeah, I think that that sounds um, you know pretty close. And it's uh, you want to be methodical. You don't want to be doing a lot of manipulation after your Macy. So that's important. But you also, uh, until your TTO is in the right spot, you really can't get your isometry for your MPFL. That's why you checked your MPFL after you finalized your TTO. Correct. So, um, yeah, but I, I think do that MPFL last because you want to. But you also don't want to. You know, again, the thing is, if you've done a good job with your Macy. You have all your retractors out, and you've already got your fixation on the patella. Uh, you're really not going to do a lot of manipulation with an MPFL. You're basically dunking it. Yep. And you're actually keeping it in alignment, which is actually better for the Macy. But I'll still check it again. Obviously, if it came out, then you have to redo certain steps. But that order has been perfect. I haven't had one that pulled out or was an issue. Yeah, for yeah, I agree. Was, it's a, for me, it's that extensile uh, central or just slightly lateral approach. I start with the lateral lengthening. I do my Macy or my MPFL anchors. I'll complete my TTO and unhinge it. 
uh, I will do my Macy and then I'll put my TTO back and then finish my MPFL. So, and then close my lateral lengthening. So I think that, uh, that sounds like we're doing it, uh, almost exactly the same, uh, order of ops, which is good. Uh, we must've learned from somewhere or, or just found that that's easiest, uh, see what he's doing now. Um, do you, how much do you range it in the OR? Uh, zero to 90 fairly aggressively. Listen, I want, I'm really aggressive in my patient's motion. Like I want them at 90 degrees at least by the two week mark. And if they're not, I'm worried, especially with non-osteotomies. So I want to make sure that implant is going to stay on really well. If I'm at all worried, I'll put a stitch in it. If it comes off here, that's okay, too, because then at least I can redo it. There's enough, uh, enough implant. So you can see here, hopefully it stayed on. Oh, nice. Perfect. So you can see that fits really well. And again, we didn't. E even with, uh, um, even with hair gel and not uh, to seal. <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, precisely. And then. Let's go back to the table really quick. I want to show them this. So this, is in, this is actually really important because when you start doing multiple defects, you guys see where, I, everyone see where I put this cut? It's not, this is not an accident. I put the cuts, I like, you'll see some of my ones where I have like three or five, two or three Macy's. So I do a number of ones that are like three different Macy's. I'll be like cutting, it looks like a little jigsaw puzzle. I'll try to find, I'll, I'll, I'll match out all the defects and try to make sure I can get them all in the same Macy. And so I usually order two implants and I'll have those as backup for these multiple defects because that's part of the ordering process. But I always try to maximize each one of these things. And the other thing is, you know, you don't want to hose yourself because you're going to do a case and have one of these pull off once in a blue moon. And so you want to be ready to go. And so I've, I've never had an issue by just trying to maximize. And again, I should have probably gotten over more for the sort of trying to harvest and save as much Macy as possible. But that's really important. And uh, once he uh, yeah. once he cuts it, he'll put the rest of that membrane into a media uh, for storage, uh, so that it remains viable. Yes, and so that's a good point. So I didn't do it here because I was in the interest of time, but I always put it right back in. Yep. And this is the area where the media is, and I just leave it like that. And again, even if you get rolled up, you always have as long as you don't cut your little um, your your left hand bottom left hand corner off, you should be totally fine in terms of finding your orientation. Uh, incredible uh, demonstration, a lot of tips and pearls uh, for our fellows. Um, again, it can seem straightforward, but the devil's in the details here, but we can get facile with it. And then I think the key theme for tonight is not only a uh, great technique, but uh, also uh, when we indicate uh, and which patients, you know, we, we choose carefully. But I think you've seen in your patients and I've seen in mine, uh, we can get incredible outcomes with Macy. And, uh, you know, we're really fortunate to have this technology in our, in our armamentarium. Uh, any final thoughts, Grant? Uh, so, in terms of the Macy, it's been an amazing thing for me. You know, it really doesn't burn me bridges like you guys mentioned, uh, which is why I really, I use it pretty aggressively and I've been extremely happy. I mean, I very rarely have to do anything extra after that. Um, and it's technically not as challenging as some other things, which is good, but you saw, hopefully the fellows saw today that all those little things that I made the same mistakes on, or we all made the same mistakes on, I'm trying to reduce all those problems for you in the future, because while it's a simple procedure, little things happen all the time. And so, having done a lot of these now, I can hopefully have showed you some tips so you have less and less problems when you start off. So your first year in practice, you're, you're four or five years in already with your tips and tricks. So hopefully it helped everybody tonight. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was great. Uh, we all learned from each other, which is the most fun of knee joint preservation. And so uh, look forward to meeting all you fellows out there in the world. Come say hi to Grant, Brian, and I, and uh, everybody have a great evening. Uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks, Grant. Bye, Thank team. You. Indication for use. 